Hello, everybody. Welcome along to the latest webinar here from Smart Cities World, the leading platform for sharing ideas that solve urban challenges. And today we're bringing this session to you in partnership with Paradox Engineering. I'm Luke Antonio, Senior Editor at Smart Cities World. I'm your moderator during this conversation where we have a fantastic panel lined up to discuss environmental sensors and their potential to improve quality of life in our cities. This is a really fascinating subject and also super relevant at, at this point in time with cities under pressure to increasingly contribute to climate action agendas. And today with the panel we have and the talking points that we have lined up gives us a really good chance to explore the cross section between technology and that kind of climate actions in cities and policy. So I'm going to hand over to the panel now to introduce themselves. Um, so come on, uh, come on screen, come off mute. Um, and after that, we'll, we'll jump straight into our conversation. So come on in, everybody. Uh, Julia, we'll start with you. Okay, thank you. This is uh, Julia Neogorgeza from Paradox Engineering. I'm the uh, Deputy General Manager of uh, this company, who's the uh, Technology and R&D Center for IoT and Smart Cities of the Minibam Mitsumi Group. And we're located in Switzerland. Perfect. Thank you very much. Guillermo, welcome along. Hello, so go, hello, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Guillermo del Campo. I come from the Technical University of Madrid. And here in webinar, I am on behalf of the Madrid City IoT Lab, uh, which is an innovative uh, experience uh, we will present later. And uh, here, yeah, we're located in Madrid, in Spain. I'm looking forward to a very interesting webinar. Thank you very much. And last but not least, our, our man in Prague. Hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. My name is Jeremy Beranek. I'm currently serving my second term at the Prague City Assembly as a deputy member. Previously served as the chairman of the ID and Small City Committee. Right now, we are finding ourselves in an interim solution. Um, but I used to serve as more or less the right hand to Mr. Mayor in the area of innovation and smart city deployment. So I'm also looking forward very much to today's uh, webinar and I'm also looking forward to hear something back from you and uh, learn more about the challenges that other cities and other organizations are facing. So thanks for having me. Uh, thank you very much and a good note to uh, to pick up because we do want to hear from everybody that's watching so please do send in your questions for the panel um we're also running a poll question which will be posted into the chat shortly so keep an eye out for that um we really want your insight and so we get a chance to discuss what your challenges are and what your input has been throughout the session um so please do keep in touch use the chat use the q a and keep an eye out for that poll um so to jump in, um, I think a good place to start is with the kinds of challenges that cities are facing. So we can set this scene um, and what their requirements are to be able to make progress in, in this area. Um, Julia, I'm going to come to you first um, to, to talk a bit about this uh, as, you, as you see it. And I know that we have a, uh, some slides prepared as well. So bear with me while I just pull that up quickly. Yeah, sure. So while you pull the slides out, um, we as an R&D company and a technology company tend to have a look at the general trends of how things look like for cities in the world. Um, so that's the kind of, um, of a starting point I'm going to take, meaning that uh, although I'm sure that any participant today would look at these data and say, oh yeah, we know that, uh, every part of the world is experiencing its own difficulties. For example, I'm Italian and the climate here is completely upside down. We're having a mild winter in the north and a very rigid one in the south, a lot of rain down south, which used to be the contrary, the opposite, I'm sorry, up to uh, a few years ago, we had floodings uh, in beautiful areas in the south, which were absolutely unexpected and were infrastructures and, uh, and uh, you know, civil governments are not, uh, you know, don't, don't have and are not, are not used to consider those kind of events as something probable and, uh, and uh, um, often happening. So 
um, besides air pollution, we know that we have a lot of climate-related events. We know that there are extreme temperatures. The other day, um, there was a TV show talking about uh, the desert in uh, Africa that is expanding uh, over and over in Mauritania and uh, um, threatening cities. So all in all, I think we can all experience uh, um, what is happening and all in all, uh, we can all see how every area, every city has very, very specific, um, specific difficulties. But what is common to everybody is the fact that especially where population is, is concentrated. And when I think about, uh, you know, a lot of population, I also think about uh, climate migrants who put uh, even more strain and pressure over, over, over um, uh, cities. So uh, anywhere there are uh, many people, there is where we see technology um, concentrating and focusing on trying to understand how it can help and how it can support all the different use cases and all the different challenges that every specific city has to has to face. On one hand, uh, uh, what technology is, uh, is asked uh, to do is to be able to monitor and collect data and information uh, that allow to prevent uh, disasters on one hand. So that allows cities to um, put in place whatever measure is needed to make sure that whatever, ha whatever happens is not threatening or is not putting people's lives in danger. Uh, but on the other hand, um, another key uh, request that technology is being made from, from users is the possibility to have granular information to inform people, not only um, governments or, or uh, you know, public entities, um, but inform people in real time for their safety and more granularly than ever, I would say. Um, and on top of that, understand trends, which in turn may feed uh, broader decisions and uh, and um, daily uh, measures. So there's a whole the whole industry is trying to tackle these challenges, um, and in the end they all um, go back to the key point that is supporting the collection of data, the correlation of data, and the possibility to extract value and use it to take action, which, as we said, is all the more relevant with where a high number of people concentrate together with their lives and their activities, like, you know, cities, big and small. So this is what we see happening nowadays. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll bring uh, Guillermo into this conversation now. I think you're kind of the bridge between the other two speakers in this in this context, really. So I'd be really keen to get your thoughts on, you know, the role that city authorities really have here um, to understand what some of their needs are, some of the use cases that you're seeing and really what kind of data might be more insightful than others to enable cities to take the kind of action that is needed at, at this point in time. Yeah, uh, so for sure, there is a need, as uh, Julia has mentioned, for granularity of data. Uh, I mean, for example, in, in Madrid, uh, regarding the air quality data uh, that have been for many years, how to say a couple of sensors located in fixed positions. And uh, so this data is not dynamic, it's not adapted to the reality of the daily life of the city, to the mobility, to the, also to the weather conditions, and so on to, to the city activity at the end. And that's one of the main aspects that has to be solved or in order to not to order to give the correct information to the city itself, to the services, but also to the citizens. So they have a clear idea of uh, how the, the city is behaving. Okay. Uh, and on the other hand, I, I will uh, come later to that, but uh, I think that is uh, really important that we take and the cities and the, also the, the companies involved in all this smart city environment, 
uh, are able to take advantage on all the sensors that are developed and are going to be developed, uh, implemented in the future uh, across services. Uh, so that's mean that, uh, for instance, the air quality sensors, as I mentioned before, can be used for air quality monitoring and taking some kind of decision that way, but also can be used in other services, as for example, uh, the traffic management, the street lighting, the prevention of uh, accidents, and so on. Yeah, for sure. It's important to keep in mind that all of these um, what feel sometimes like individual elements are all linked into this into these challenges. Um, Yaren, I'll come to you next to, to get same same question really, um, but bearing in mind the integrated nature of of this challenge that we just mentioned as well. Oh, sorry, you are on mute. Sorry, I switched to the wrong screen and not bearing in mind that I, I have to turn the sound on as well. <laughs> I fully agree with what Guillermo just said. Um, the challenges for the city of Prague and uh, how I understand the role of the cities in the first place are pretty much similar to all major European cities. Just to give, to give you a rough idea, Prague has a population of 1.3 million, the metropolitan area in total around 2 2.5 million, depending on how you count it. What is rather significant for the city of Prague that we have every day three to four hundred uh, thousand commuters, um, which has quite a crucial impact on how the city is living, because most of the commuters um, are used to use their individual cars to get in the city and out of it, and that contributes largely to the general level of pollution. Interestingly, although Prague has one of um, the greatest um, public transportation riderships uh, within within the whole of Europe or maybe all around the world, we have a high proportion of individual car transportation as well. I'm sorry about the baby sound in the background, um, so please just forgive me. There is there is there is my girlfriend you know, taking care of the baby. So despite this fact. Uh, the quality of the air is not at its best and uh, we rank quite low, uh, very, very similar to cities like Warsaw uh, or Budapest that might have uh, some regional correlation, but uh, we aim much higher. In the past few years, we decided to run a few pilot programs, uh, obviously with the uh, air quality monitoring sensors similar to the city of Madrid, but our first and primary experience was not that, that positive because um, you know, we tested the products of several companies, including Chinese companies, and we learned that in our specific climate conditions with cold, cold winters and warm summers, we uh, have to, you know, pay a huge attention to uh, warming up the sensors to ensure that uh, the data that we collect from the sensors are comparable all around the year. And similar other projects uh, proved out not to be very viable. Uh, we also uh, got in touch with um, Audi uh, through the uh, Skoda car manufacturer to test their air quality containers. You might have heard about it. It's like a, a sea shipping container, uh, which encompasses technology for not strictly speaking, sucking out the dust of the air, but um, you know, running through uh, the air some uh, through some HEPA filters and making sure that the air that uh, flows out freely will be cleaner than before. But it turned out that it's not very efficient in the most um, most polluted streets within the city center with high uh, car traffic, because uh, the most polluted air concentrates around uh, the third uh, overground floor uh, where we cannot easily install uh, technologies like this one. But I will talk about it uh, a, little, a little bit more later. What I find uh, is the crucial precaution uh, that we adopted two years ago was um, the approval of uh, our Prague climate plan up to the year 2030, where we also, you know, make a commitment of the city of Prague that we want to lower the CO2 emissions by 45% compared to the year 2010 until 2030 and become a climate neutral or CO2 neutral if you want city by 2050. So, um, I mean, in total, I would uh, in the future like to put a higher stress uh, on education with school kids because this I, I find is uh, extremely important to let everyone know uh, that we do care about uh, what the younger generation believes is important. And also we would like to uh, continue with testing the new technologies, possibly uh, in cooperation with uh, progressive companies and also other cities. And here I must uh, very highly estimate 
the efforts of the European Commission and EU programs like Horizon, where uh, we have successfully applied for a, key, a couple uh, new European Bauhaus projects. So this is basically what uh, lies at the center of our efforts, and I'm looking forward to hear more on. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. I think you know just to just to pick up on on what you've shared, it's equally as important to know what isn't working as it is to know what is working, um, because no city has time and resource to to spare um in in the face of these sorts of challenges um like you say we'll, we'll come up to talk about that a little more um in in a few minutes um now is probably a good time for us to launch the poll that i mentioned earlier on um and so you'll have seen our admin has just posted that in the chat do take a look we're asking which environmental parameters are being monitored in your area in your city at the moment um and at the end um we will we'll take a look at, at everybody's input and uh and and see what kind of insight we can we can pull from that um so you will need to take a look at uh penty.com and input the uh input the code which has just been shared so do get in touch do let us know and keep any questions coming in as well for the panel for anything that you might be curious about um circling back then um so we we've heard uh, a little bit about what's what's happened in Prague um, and where some of those um, some where some of those efforts have, have been over over the last little while. And we'll circle back to you again, Yaramir, in in a little in a little while. Um, but Julia, bringing bringing it back to you, it would be interesting to know what kind of works you're currently engaged in at Paradox um, and to see really after that you know how that resonates with the rest of the panel um and you know how that shapes up and compares really to what they're seeing in in their own cities uh oh so you're on the there you go sorry <laughs> um there's always that so um there's a number of projects that we are uh involved with uh, uh, in different parts of the world and uh, some of them are pretty I would say well known like monitoring PM10 or uh, uh, monitoring uh, humidity to make sure no irrigation resources are wasted so uh, these are let me say more um, uh, heard of whereas I'd like to um, talk about Nazushiobara which is uh, a city in Japan as uh, you may or may not know our mother company is Japanese um, and uh, Japan has a very um, climate challenged situation uh, for it because of its you know natu natural uh, resources position uh, um, and so on um there's a there's also another another factor to consider japan has uh, a stronger problem in dealing with aging uh population uh this very morning i think i read a, a news about uh, the prime minister mentioning how complex it is going to be to balance this you know <laughs> lack of balance between the aging society and uh, and uh, the number of, uh, of of young people supporting economy and the like so uh, clearly uh, they have a special attention for uh, um, this part of of the population and japan also has a very high attention for the safety of their of their citizens so the city of nazushiobara which is uh, a little north uh, from tokyo started their, we like to call it smart city journey a couple of years ago. Um, they started deploying uh, smart LED street lights. They equipped them with wireless dimming control technology and that already allowed them to uh, achieve uh, a few um, directions from, uh, from the government in terms of CO2 reduction and uh, uh, power consumption reduction reduction then they uh, tried to go on um, decided to go a step further and they turned to citizens uh, safety uh, and well-being they added um, 
30 pyranometers and environmental sensors. So pyranometers are devices that monitor solar uh, radiations. So um, their objective uh, with that is uh, being able to tell their citizens when it's not safe to leave their houses or to be around because or of extreme solar irrad irradiance or and that, that's also connected to very high temperatures uh, that could provoke heat stroke. Uh, also, they um, deployed uh, rain gauges together with smart cameras to monitor um, road conditions during heavy rains. And that is also aimed at being able to promptly inform citizenship about which roads not to take or again, when not to leave their houses, uh, so to make sure that nobody is is uh, is uh, threatened or or is in danger, I think that this is a very um, interesting example of a um, real life application which goes beyond uh, uh, you know the big data concept, but which really takes data, uh, extracts extract its uh, value and use them for the ben tangible benefit of, of citizens. Many times, uh, all these sort of uh, IoT infrastructures, smart city projects, so they are launched, uh, announced, uh, and then if you go on the road and ask your, your, uh, uh, your uh, you know, uh, fellow citizens, uh, oh, what do you know about what the city is doing about smart city? Probably they would say not much, well, nothing really tangible. In this case, uh, these Japanese citizens uh, can touch and experience and get tangible benefits from the application of, I'd like to say existing technology, with uh, uh, applications that serve their very, very specific needs. And in the same way, I would say that there might be a number of such examples uh, that is as high as the number of different cities and different conditions they have. The key point here is that technology today, um, especially if it's able to, as you were saying before, you know, connect different applications, connect different data, and really um, pull intelligence, pull value out of that, then technology can really serve uh, uh, the apparently, you know, minute and granular needs of even single boroughs, which are anyway very relevant and especially provide immediate return, both for the decisions taken, for the money spent, um, and ultimately for the, um, uh, you know, city agencies that are behind them. Yeah, for sure. I think it's really, it's a really fascinating example. Um, because like you say, it, it's all about serving citizens in exactly. that, in, in the best possible way, giving them the information to make those informed choices. And in that way, actually offer them choices that they previously, you know, wouldn't have known that they had um it's it's just making all of this much clearer much more transparent and giving access to that really critical information um and of course what it does for the authorities like you say as well is enable agencies across the city to kind of get on the same page um use the same information and break down some of these really long-standing silos um so I think it's a it's a it's a fantastic example to to be able to share, um, and we'll well we'll 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 branch out here to to Prague and Madrid as well. Um, Guillermo, how does this kind of resonate with with what you see in in your city? Um, you know, in terms especially in terms of kind of breaking down those informational departmental silos. Um, and starting to get this information out into the into the public realm for people to be able to make those sorts of decisions for themselves. Yeah. So yeah, that's a that's a good question. <laughs> so uh, Madrid City, as 
uh, I presume uh, most of other cities, has a, a urban agenda that is very well aligned with the Green Deal and the 2030 agenda, 2050 agenda, and always uh, looking towards a more sustainable uh, and reducing CO2 emissions and so on. Uh, specifically, Madrid has uh, conducted some uh, pilot experiences and some uh, very interesting initiatives. For example, the public transport float, the bus uh, float, uh, is not longer using foil, foil um, uh, oil, uh, but uh, still, uh, still there is much to do, uh, and uh, specifically. Uh, in the in the field of engaging uh, initiative from different areas or different services, and that is not only a human being how to say problem uh, of uh, getting to two different people, two different areas, two different services to talk, to discuss, to meet, and to uh, to agree on on how to 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 proceed, but also it's a technological problem, and uh, that's why. Uh, the city of Madrid, together with the Technical University of Madrid, and more specifically a research center uh, where I work that is called CEDINT, uh, we have created a uh, know, innovation, uh, in, innovative uh, initiative that is called the uh, IoT uh, Lab of the Madrid City. And the aim of this lab is uh, to work. In, in, in standardization in order to achieve interoperability across different uh, city services. Okay, This is an initiative that is a public private uh, kind of project initiative because it's also funded by a, a consortium of industrial parties uh, called uh, Company Forum of the Madrid City. And uh, so it is funded and also uh, the industry themselves are part of this laboratory, uh, an active part. So we cover uh, the, how to say, the, the four main stakeholders, which are the city, the university, the industry, and of course, at the end, the, the citizens, because everything that we will do from the beginning, uh, from the, how to say, more research or more, uh, laboratory oriented to the real implementation in the city to to all the technology uh, how to say uh, learning and how how the technology works uh, we will move also toward the citizens uh, doing different learning sessions workshops and engaging the citizens and the end okay and uh, what we want to do in this uh, laboratory, in the IoT laboratory, is to, to analyze uh, what are the, the, the problems, uh, why there is not uh, interconnection between services and between technologies, and why, why is that? Because there is a huge amount of different communication protocols, different type of uh, devices, different type of interfaces and so on related to the IoT uh, devices and solutions. Uh, no, there's not only the, the sensors or controllers themselves, but also the platforms. And we, what we are uh, working in in this uh, laboratory is toward the definition of a, how to say, a standard uh, model to, to be able to uh, interact with, within the different services. And the idea, as I mentioned before, is that, for example, if we have a, a, a quality sensor, is that value can be used in order to improve the services, for example, uh, provided by the waste, man uh, waste management uh, services or, or the street lighting uh, systems. Yeah, for sure. Uh, it's really interesting. And it, it's again it, it just demonstrates how widespread these efforts are across different city departments um Jeremy I'll bring you back in here as well to to go into a bit more depth about what you were speaking about uh about before um you know besides from those things that have kind of 
potentially not not worked out as as seen what else is the city of prague currently uh, kind of trialing what kind of work are you engaged in um to you know to make progress in this area but also to connect up some of these data and information points i must say first that it's really exciting to hear about the news from the other cities I'm not a technical guy myself, so I will speak more generally uh, in general terms like a politician. Uh, we have also big visions like the city of Madrid, but uh, Prague in general finds itself to be in a position of uh, a flower city, city um, that also goes hand in hand together with our dominant participation in, in the European projects, as I've mentioned. We are in Spain uh, ourselves, usually from cities like Amsterdam, London, or also Lyon in some aspects. Uh, and what I personally believe was the biggest leap forward uh, or the source of inspiration for us was uh, the foundation of our own city data platform in 2018, which also helps to standardize um, the formats of the data inputs and outputs that we are collecting and we are working uh, further on with. And this is extremely important because it really enables everyone, be it uh, a scientist, be it a student or you know, just a citizen to take part in what is happening in the city. At the moment, uh, we are having around 120 data sets um, updated regularly on daily or weekly basis. And it has turned out that um, opposed, opposing my uh, first expectations, people, people are not that interested into, into the data yet. So we decided to start up you know, a server that in a graphically attractive form uh, would bring the information to the people uh, much closer to show them uh, funny pictures and um, compare the city of Prague and its performance with uh, other major European cities. But still, I think we have a lot of a lot of work to do in order to raise the awareness because um, if you ask most of the people in the city of Prague what the biggest problems are, are in, in, in their view and what they believe the city can have a major influence on, it would be uh, in the first place, the traffic and uh, affordable housing. Uh, surprisingly, not the climate change or environmental environmental issues and questions. So uh, we sort of have to follow their wishes, but um, nonetheless, we are trying to do uh, the job that, that I've mentioned as well. What I would like to, um, pinpoint as and stress is uh, similar to the city of Madrid or we are working on um, not strictly speaking IOT labs but uh, projects of living labs um, in cooperation with Prague universities and that I find in extremely inspiring because in um, a limited area you can test the technologies and if they prove to be successful then you go uh, full scale all around the city and it's a it saves a lot of money and um, if you manage to bring on board some industrial partners, it can be also a source of inspiration for innovative companies. And here we have also a great cooperation with the European Space Agency. You might know that Prague is the seat of European Union uh, Space Program Agency. Um, and uh, what we do is we invest um, quite quite a lot of money in uh, incubation and acceleration of startups that bring space technologies down to the earth. And that has a huge impact on um, the air quality monitoring and the state of vegetation monitoring, because uh, thanks to a satellite program like Copernicus, uh, we can monitor really, um, I would say, real real time the state of uh, the greenery and forest in, in the city of Prague and then take uh, the measures that are needed, like uh, increased irrigation or possibly also um, reinstating uh, the flow of uh, Prague streams and rivers to its original state. And uh, it turns out to be very, very successful. Uh, we have a use case of, I would say, uh, you know, smaller river uh, close to the city center. And now we have meanders all around and the level of humidity in the whole area increased greatly. And it's also very popular, not, not just for the citizens, but for, for uh, the wild animals and uh, it's, like a sanctuary but there are also other more funny examples and th this might be seen as um, you know an example of a fuck up excuse my french uh where uh, we installed uh, japanese satellite technology to measure uh, water leakages in in the pipes not uh, ours 
<laughs> not ours. <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry. No, 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 not really. Uh, Microsoft Technologies. And uh, as a result, when we fixed it, um, there was a green area around. It uh, became completely dry. So uh, sometimes when you are trying to mend or repair things, it might uh, end up uh, being in a uh, worse condition than before. So, you know, we really have to balance what we are doing and um, sometimes slow down and, and, and think first twice before uh, we do things that are really irreversible. I, I don't know if I've really completely answered your question. I'm, I'm trying more to pick up uh, funny examples and, and you know, uh, data that can be different from other cities, but I'm uh, trying to, at the same time, Answer, answering the questions from from the general public and uh, the listeners in this webinar, so happy happy to continue. Yeah, please do, please do. I've seen questions being answered direct by by the speaker, which is fantastic. Keep them coming in, but I think it's really useful to to see that as well. Um, I, we are going to get technical for a uh, for a few minutes and talk a bit more about the solutions and the technologies that can really make an impact here, um, and. Yuli, I'm going to come back to come back to you as the representative from a technology company um, on this webinar, and to, to find out really what the what the current state of the technology for a smart environment is at at the moment, um, so that we can understand really you know what's available to cities to use to implement, and also get some idea of the kind of working relationship between public and private to be able to make this work? Sure. Um, so to answer this question, I'd like to hook up with one of the questions that the audience just just uh, just, uh, just asked. Uh, that is the one related to um, lighting infrastructure and how and if that is relevant to support environmental sensing deployment. So, um, since we're talking about smart cities and you're asking me where where is uh, and what's the status of environmental technology. So let me put it in a smart city perspective. So we saw a sort of an excursus uh, starting with the street lighting and smart street lighting a few years back. So smart cities was all about making street lights smart. Um, dimmable, remotely controlled. And the reason was pretty, was and is still valid uh, and was pretty straightforward. Uh, um, uh, street lights are an immediate way to act on to CO2 emission reduction, um, power costs uh, reduction, and also operational costs, and also a very tangible service and application whose improvement citizens immediately see. So that is a very, uh, that is also a very effective uh, decision for uh, uh, city agencies to take uh, to provide, uh, once again, tangible improvements, which uh, have a direct and very visible ROI, uh, knowing that any decisions cities take is taken with citizens' money. Uh, also, street lighting has a very, very direct uh, link with the real and also perceived safety. Not sure, now I don't wanna go off topic here, but uh, um, there are studies from the um, University of Edinburgh, if I'm not wrong, that mention that if you have men and women draw their maps of their city, being the city the same, they draw different maps because of how safe they perceive different areas. And not surprisingly, those different areas are um, exactly the same um, along with how well lit these areas are. So the better uh, they're lit up, the, the safer they're perceived. So for this reason, uh, for these reasons, so street lighting um, has started to be the first application in the smart journey of, of many cities. And it's still like that today. Uh, street lighting is a widespread um, service, and the moment you turn street lights uh, as part of a network, you immediately have a citywide 
IoT network, basically, to hook up other applications uh, to. Now, this takes us and, and bridges us to your question. So where is uh, environmental technology today and, and how can it make a difference and uh, how can private and public work together? So the real value is uh, uh, for cities when they can um, access open technology and, uh, and uh, uh, companies who provide technology who is able to work together with other technology choices they have made in the past or they're going to make in the future. Um, Guillermo was talking about connecting information coming from different services and applications. Between street lighting and environmental sensing, we have had and we still have smart parking, traffic applications, and even smart waste. Uh, along all this route, we don't know what next challenge cities will have to, to, to tackle. We really don't know. Same as we don't know where, where technology is going to go. Um, we like to say that we had no idea we would talk about connecting all this stuff over to the internet you know, a couple of decades back. So we have no idea what we will be able to connect in a couple of decades from now on. Um, however, what we know for sure is that cities, as far as our experience as a technology provider, but also as far as our own experience as, as citizens can tell, for sure cannot uh, afford to make choices today that they have to completely erase and, and strike to tomorrow to change everything because, oh God, these two technologies don't work together and we need something more. So let's scrap everything and change it. There's a, a, there's a point that technology can help cities to, um, you know, a conundrum that we can help cities to solve that is, on one hand, the very short political cycles, five years or so, but on the other hand, uh, city infrastructures which are demanded to last for decades. So this is where uh, technology can really work together with cities, on one hand, allowing this long-lasting um, journey to start and, and, uh, and go on, and on the other hand, to understand real needs of each and every city and work together with local partners and local providers because you know we as a technology company we can provide base technology but we will never be able to uh, guess or or learn or understand or serve every single very different request from from every uh, city in the world neither would we want to because there's a whole a world of local companies who are much better geared to do that. So this is where the ecosystem works and this is where the technology can really act as a, um, the catalyst in, in, in the chemical sense of the reaction, you know, to make everything work together to the next step for cities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's no, really, it's really valuable to insight to, to hear that i think um like you say the, the the challenges that each city faces they're very very bespoke um and resp responding to each one of those is it's, very, it's a very tricky thing but you have to make sure that there's that longevity um when you're um weighing up these sorts of buying decisions and where you're going to procure the technology from um Jeremy I'll, I'll come to you um to, to talk about this a, a little more as well um I feel like you're kind of uniquely placed here to maybe talk about this given that you are slightly in between uh city governments at the moment um and so to just understand you know how this sort of factors in really when you're making the decision on on technology um to properly serve the city for the long term, um, especially when you eventually end up, as all cities will, kind of in between different um, 
different governments, different mayors, different politicians? Uh, thank you for the question, Luke. Uh, I mean that you nailed it at the moment because you know for the city the most difficult task is to embrace the new technology while having none or very limited previous experience with it firsthand. So we try to learn from other cities. For us, the key uh, inspirational cities would be probably cities of Vienna, Munich, or Berlin. So whatever they have, we might be looking up to them to try and test it as well. But um, in the reality, you have to always persuade um, the city clerks, uh, the people who work for the city of Prague as the institution to, um, you know, take their interest into education and learn about the new technologies. Because unless they believe a new technology is trustworthy and there might be a reasonable rate of return, they will not be able to support the idea maybe with a few exceptions like if the project is um you know fully eu funded and they have very very little um to risk in general i would say and this might be similar to other countries as well in our culture there is um very very high level of uh, risk aversion and with that goes hand in hand um you know the unwillingness to uh test the technologies that have not pr proven their case uh somewhere else what also helps is if uh, the companies approach us and try to offer a joint pilot program, uh, which might be one of the few exceptions uh, when, when we do not have to run the public tenders. It's usually, you know, governed by, by the European Commission rules up to 80,000 euros. But in general, I would say uh, similar to what I mentioned right at the beginning with the students and school kids, you have to educate uh, the city officials and, and the people that work for the city in order to raise the awareness that there are technologies that might help the city um, shift up to a high gear and um, possibly prove that the successful use cases uh, have worked out somewhere else. Um, once again, I do not know if I fully answer if I'm fully answering your question, uh, but I've been in, in the past few years approached by maybe 100 different companies from all, all different uh, areas within smart city technologies and i kept telling them all you know it's probably better if you do not approach us with a ready-made solution because none of the solutions can be really ready-made uh, for that particular customer and instead of that you rather try to talk about um, um the possible impacts on you know, the city infrastructure or the city environment and uh bring up your case that it's not uh, the particular technology that is bringing the solution, but uh, really make people aware that they have a problem in the first place. Mm, yeah, absolutely. That's really valuable. Um, and, you know, it's it's another part of this conversation that that we have to bear in mind is the is that continuity um and Guillermo I'll, I'll bring you back in here as well. So it's, obviously it's not just the continuity uh, in terms of handing these things over from person to person through the years with that continuity in existing technology as Julia was mentioning as well ensuring that there's interoperability between different solutions different vendors um you know how important is that in in the decision making process um to to actually make the decision to to bring this sort of technology on board um and then you know in terms of priorities, where does that measure against, for example, um, data accuracy um, and ensuring that these solutions are are secure? Yeah. So uh, yeah, that, that's a good question. And uh, regarding uh, what are the priorities or, or the decision uh, how to how to do that uh, from the cities. Uh, we have to take in mind that uh, when when the city decides to 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 go with a new deployment with a new static deployment uh, in a, a specific location or on a specific service, uh, they want it to work for a couple of years. I mean, a couple of years is ten or more. <laughs> okay. So uh, maybe the technology in, in this period has changed a lot, maybe, not, of course, for sure. <laughs> but uh, 
but uh, what they have to, to ensure is that uh, although these technological evolutions, uh, the system is going able to perform and also adapt to the to the uh, innovations. Okay, and how to do that? For sure, uh, going with uh, compatible uh, solutions compatible with the standards. Okay. Uh, for example, there were some questions uh, in the QA panel about uh, yeah how to to integrate the street lights and with other sensors and well the the most easy way to do that is to to, inter to integrate the the new if you deploy new luminaires new street lights with standard uh, connectivity interfaces like for example Saga or NEMA that uh, will allow the integration the, the interconnection of uh, sensors uh, environmental sensor any kind of sensor okay in a very how to say that way for way uh, another way to to assure ensure how to say yeah continuity of the of these systems is to take to take also in, in consideration the the powering of the of the solution of the sensors and so on Okay, it's quite straightforward for the street lights. We have uh, DC uh, main power electricity, and there will be for forever. <laughs> but uh, if we have to deploy sensors in the middle of a park, for example, in a natural area where there is not this such a, a infrastructure, uh, they have to be battery powered. And maybe it's not the best solution just to be battery powered. So there was also a question in the QA asking about the uh, photovoltaic, uh, the solar power uh, sensors. And it's a good option because it will ensure that the, the, the device uh, will uh, uh, continue to work longer. Okay. And also, uh, I wanted to connect to one of the other questions uh, in the panel that asking about how the maintenance of the IoT sensor uh, is going to be done. Okay, and uh, it's also the technology has advanced so that uh, nowadays sensors are able to to remotely from the technology provider headquarters, for instance, or for the city uh, management center, because uh, all their fine work, software related uh, maintenance works were, can be done uh, via internet. So that's not a problem. Of course, if there is a hardware issue, it has to be solved uh, physically. But uh, again, if uh, we use uh, in standard interfaces, also it can be very easily solved, either replacing the 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 node or also solving the problem. Ah, thank you very much. Um, I think it's it's really really useful to 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 have that to have that feedback and to understand, you know, exactly some of those requirements as as you see them. Um, I think um, we are going to take a few a uh, few audience questions very quickly, and then we'll take a look at the results from the uh, from the poll, um, which we've been running this whole time. Thanks a lot for um, for your yeah. responses there. Keep look, keep them coming; one, it's still open. Look, there is one question that I'd like to start with because I just saw it, and I yeah, see that Yaromir is also interested into the uh, reply. So. Uh, Alex uh, asked, uh, says that there seems to be a conflict, I'm reading, between ready-made solutions for cities and the bespoke requirements that many cities have and customization needs. How can you as a solution provider, so I guess this is, this is for me, actually find a scalable business? So uh, I'm taking this one because, well, it's clearly for us, but because I can, I'd like to answer with a couple of, of keywords. One is um openness uh allowing partnerships and the second one is an eye on uh, economic and city uh economy sustainability of solutions so on one hand we clearly cannot 
uh, serve everybody directly and directly only. And it is more and more the very nature of how business is working overall. But how can you do that? On one hand, you have to do that by allowing multiple parties to come into the game. And generally, um, it, this is not this does not go together with cities being big or small. But as I said, uh, short, uh, short, you know, a few minutes back, provi tech, uh, technology providers uh, provide, you know, ground technology, and then they have to foster uh, an ecosystem and a context of different partnerships, which can each and everyone add their own little piece. And the more local these partners are the better for two reasons. Why? Uh, one is that they have a, a privileged position to know and tap into very specific city challenges. And on the other hand, um, they will be the choice for cities that fosters city economy. And this is something that we have always uh, meant to be uh, you know, the objective of, of our smart city vision. So on one hand, opening up technology for the benefit of, of cities, but also allowing better quality of life um, and better economic sustainability, where with economic sustainability, not only we mention, not only do we mention uh, uh, ROI, but really generating uh, business for communities. So, you know, helping them thrive. If you go back to Scavenge, our communication for the past 10 years, you, you really find these keywords, livability, local, uh, you know, sustainability and economy uh, spread over all of our communication. So um, this is how I would say we can um, you know, find this balance. On one hand, we provide technology, this technology is open and we work in partnership with different partners along with specific cities which um, can serve uh, the uh, specific uh, um, challenges and needs. I appreciate you taking that, Julia, because I think it's really useful to kind of demonstrate um, the kind of potential route to these really valuable relationships and working partnerships um, that work for cities um, and ultimately then for their citizens as well. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's really useful to to hear. Um, I, I think 15, 16 questions might be the most we've ever answered in a single hour's session. Um, so we have a few minutes left and in that time, uh, I'd like to just review those poll answers. Um, so here's what we have um and given the basis of of today's discussion um i don't think there'll be too many surprises that um air quality is the most um kind of monitored environmental um metric in in people's kind of local areas at the moment um but not too far behind it we have um obviously rainfall and water quality as well um i just wanted to get the panel's thoughts on the results that we're seeing on here see whether you're surprised by anything at all um and from a city perspective uh to understand you know how well these tie in with your priorities for what you want to monitor and what that tells you about what your next steps might need to be I will throw it open. Um, Yaramir, maybe I will come to you first just to get that city perspective and what you're seeing here. Well, if you ask me to reflect on uh, the data that we have collected uh, throughout this panel, uh, I would say that we have quite a lot of work to do in front of us because, you know, as, as I understand in other uh, European and, and world cities, they are all way ahead of us. And we should probably try um, as the city government to um, um, secure a stable budget to implement the smart city technologies, which has not been the case until recently. I, I have answered a question like that in, in the chat as well. 
and um, possibly also we should focus more on informing the general public and the Prague citizens because as I mentioned right at the beginning uh, we are not doing the best job because people are still not as interested as as they uh, might want to be because it has a huge impact on their daily quality of life and you know staying behind and complaining about uh, heavy traffic without thinking about what the heavy traffic um, has an impact of on, on their uh, health uh, is somehow um, somehow complicating complicating the situation you know but I'm optimistic I'm always optimistic I uh, look uh, very much forward in in the future uh, that the technologies will help us and I believe that uh, if seminars and talks like like this are, are in place for the city representatives they will you know uh, catch their no nose and, and see uh, that it's not just the city of Prague but probably the whole region that that has a lot lot of uh, work to do uh, in order to perform better yeah yeah this is, for sure. this is, this cool. is how I have my, on my mind perfect and Yulia I'll come to you just finally we're slightly over time just a, a final word on some of those on some of those poll results what we've seen there um and what that shows you uh, uh well um what we can what I see what I read in these uh, in these words uh, uh on one hand, I can see what we also see in the projects where we are deploying all over the world. So we have um, um, air quality and we have weather data and we have rainfalls uh, and we have, uh, I've seen somewhere, um, something else related to water. So, uh, um, and I also see the same thing that we are, that we are, um, um, registering basically from 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 daily reality uh, after the uh, what well, with and just after the pandemic we were expecting uh, quality of air monitoring to be uh, very much linked to um, possibility of you know viruses or linked to health uh, um, meaning as I said. Uh, diseases or that specific context. Uh, on the contrary, just after, you know, we're seeing this year and already uh, last year, that it's gone back to pre-pandemic um, requests, like being more um, focused on PM10 or pollution, uh, uh, more intended as an effect of, of, of human activities, traffic, uh, you know, heating and the like. So uh, that's uh, uh, kind of unexpected. I mean, we are we are just it, of course. We see it, but we were expecting something some, something different. And it's uh, you know, uh, it's a surprise that we're that we're seeing. Um, interestingly, I see vegetation pests. So there's also something connecting to the um, let me say natural uh, world, which reminds me of. A very, uh, I wouldn't say particular, but interesting application of environmental sensitiveness that we've seen uh, in uh, in Switzerland. There's a city who decided to implement um, uh, motion sensors along uh, 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 a couple of streets, uh, not only and, on, and not necessarily focusing on reducing CO2 or reducing power consumption or reducing their costs or providing a better service to citizens, but their uh, utmost interest was not bother natural lives. So animals that are disturbed by excessive uh, um, illumination in the surroundings. Uh, so there's also this, this kind of application which goes together with, you know, the big environmental, uh, environmental uh, um, uh, topic. Yeah, absolutely. It's a really good point. Uh... To, to consider it's uh it is it, a massive part of it it's coexisting and finding Very solutions much. in in nature um 
so it's it's a it's a really valid point um we are over time so we'll we'll have to wrap things up there unfortunately um but it has been great to understand what some of the challenges requirements and needs are in in cities and also to see some of the work that is already underway here in in this kind of area um but it's obvious as well that there's still so much potential for for progress here different ways of working different ways of working collaboratively as well um and i think that you know we always encourage people uh, in in these discussions to keep in contact um to keep the conversation going and that's that's where i'll i'll kind of leave leave off here as well um i'm sure that our our panelists here would be happy to answer any other questions offline although they have been working incredibly hard um <laughs> to uh to answer those questions as they've come in already this afternoon um but do keep in touch um reach out and um the last thing to do is to, to thank you all for watching and to thank the panel for for their insights and their time so thank you all very much and uh, i'm sure we'll see you on the next one thank you thank you very much it's a pleasure. Thank, you. thank you thank you very much thank you